Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Sunless Skies. In the last episode we were on the hunt for bees and I feel we'll be on the same hunt in this episode but while we were looking around for said bees we came across Raider's Wood so I think it's only fair we take a look around before we continue. Traitor's Wood is a sprawling secluded forest on the edge of the Reach. Few venture beneath its gloomy burrs and legend speaks of a king who sleeps under the barrow at the wood's heart. Let's start at the top and see what happens here. The wood's edge. The wood is vast as a fell giant and fathomless as a great ocean. Like the ocean, much of it is hidden from view. Careful expeditions are required to go deeper into the wood. The forest is rich and wild in the verdant species of the reach. Exploring the starlit, dappled edges of the wood could be profitable. Okay, so we can only perform one of these actions a fortnight. The wood guards its secrets. We can only do one of these easily. We can gather flowers. The flora that grow in the shadow of the regent's grave are unique to this corner of the high wilderness. We can hunt. The game in the forest is unparalleled. The glories of the sport it offers are spoken of even in the hunting lodges of Port Avon. We can slumber in the wood. Starlight silvers the branches above you. Birds call quietly. Rest. Let's see if we can gather flowers. We have a 75% chance. By a lake, grey as the eye of a storm, you find a promising patch of herbs, green and gold and wonderful. Your crew help you gather those that seem the least familiar, for surely those will fetch the highest price. Deeper in the wood, where the light is almost drowned by the thirsty silverwood trees, you find flowers of every hue of Navarantine. You gather what you can. We get one sack of verdant seeds. Very useful. Next on the list is a campfire. Three figures, draped in scholars' robes, huddle around a campfire. They are arguing about kings. A banner in the colours of Somerset, London University's most respectable college, gleams in the firelight. As you approach, the discussion dies. One of the scholars, a woman with a fierce expression, stands up. Only scholars should be here. Are you one? Um, you know I am not. Perhaps a gift would persuade them to let you enter the camp. They look wretched, camped out here. We could give one of our supplies to let us in. Ah, curiosity and all that, let's find out. The vituperative classicist compares your offering with the burnt toast and one tea they had been suffering on. Well, all right, I suppose. The woman is a vituperative classicist. Her companions, a dismal paleographer, a forlorn young man, and a feckless theologian, a handsome youth with an easy smile. They explain that they are here to enter the regent's grave, where they believe a sleeping king lies buried. They do not agree as to the king's identity. Unfortunately, the college has cut our funding, the classicist explains. Speak to us if you're interested in helping. The shadow of the barrow falls over the camp, a mournful wail carries on the wind. A cluster of scholars has set up camp on the border of the wood. Their funding gone, they struggle to continue their research into whatever is entombed in the region's grave. The wind howls in the trees, and the skies threaten rain. The scholars huddle in their tents, brooding over papers and conspiring against colleagues. Right, well, how can we help? The scholars intimated that you might be able to help them continue their explorations into the wood. Your inquiry induces a rare spirit of cooperation in the scholars. The last expedition into the woods found a document written in the correspondence. 
It contained directions to a place called the Steward's Font, the theologian explains. Alas, that is all it needs to break their allegiance. The Thaleographer begins to argue that the steward was a chief physician in Charlemagne's household. The classicist makes a pointed reference to Inanna's husband. The theologian's smile is forced. If you could find the font, it would be an immense boon to my work. There are sputters of protestation. Our work. You can begin this expedition from expeditions into the deep of the wood. Well, let's speak to the vituperative classicist. The student of the ancient world is armed with more scorn than a vengeful goddess and a firm conviction that a Sumerian queen of heaven sleeps in the region's grave. The classicist's tent is practical and largely unornamented. The interior is damp from her various walking clothes which have been scattered across the floor. Old playbills and gaudy costume jewellery hang from the tent ceiling like charms. The classicist is pacing the tent, reading Herodotus while smoking up a storm. Well, let's ask the classicist about her theory. Why does she believe an ancient Sumerian deity in Anna is buried in a forgotten tomb in the high wilderness? Isn't it obvious? She rolls her eyes. Fine, I'll tell you what I told the academic senate. The high wilderness is heaven. Not as the church conceives it, but as the Sumerians did. A place of stars and chaos and impossible powers in proximity to and affecting our own world, but far, far removed. He pauses for breath. Inanna, the queen of heaven, entered the underworld in search of her husband and was trapped for a time. That is the myth. This may be the truth. She waves her hand dismissively. Besides, we made some promising discoveries in the wood. Can you tell me what they are? Hmm. Let's ask about the feckless theologian. What does she think of her academic colleague? Her invective goes on for an hour, and she only remembers to fetch you tea midway through. A liar, a traitor, and a fool, she says, spooning in entirely too much sugar. I loathe him. Her hand shakes. As she pours. Okay, but what about the paleographer? What does she think of her academic colleague? She laughs scornfully, but refuses to be drawn. I will not waste breath on the undeserving. Alright, well, let's return to the camp, see if we can talk to the other lot. Let's talk to the... Eckless Theologian? Yeah, have these moved around? Hmm, <laughs> confusing. Let's speak to the theologian. The divinity student has a dozen bad habits and a firm conviction that Saint John the Apostle slumbers in the regent's grave. The theologian's tent is the largest of the three. Its interior has been decorated with carpets and throws which trap the smoke from his hookah. The air is a scented fug. The theologian is reclining on cushions, drinking wine. Well, let's, uh, let's ask him about his theory. Why does he think that St. John is buried in a forgotten tomb in the high wilderness? The theologian's eyes widen. He is delighted to have been asked that question. According to Legina Ura, St. John is sleeping somewhere waiting for the coming of the Antichrist, which would mean the end of the world. And what is the high wilderness but that? We left the world behind, and the stars are going out. And just after we arrive, we discover a tomb, hidden in an ancient wood. He runs a hand through his hair. Sometimes we must have faith. Okay. What do you think about the dismal paleographer? The theologian smiles innocently. Yes, we used to know each other very well indeed. This was back at college, before all his passion got sucked out of him, he sighs. Some people can't accept change. What about the classicist? She's very talented and very funny, and not at all nice. 
and she's furious with me. Why? Why, he won't say. I think I've done enough damage with both of them. He shakes his head. If it weren't for St. John and the Academic Senate sending me here, I doubt I'd have ever seen her again. Until she became principal, of course. Oh, well, there's one left to talk to here. We need to talk to the dismal paleographer. The forlorn student of medieval manuscripts believes that the Emperor Charlemagne lies in the regent's grave. The paleographer's tent is some distance from the rest of the camp, and almost in the forest. It is smaller and more worn than the tents of the others. Inside, however, the tent is both warm and sturdy. No rain leaks through the oil skin. The paleographer's inks and reference books and old theatre handbills are neatly sorted. The paleographer is at a little wooden desk, congelating the subjunctive. Ask about his theory. Why does he think the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne is buried in a forgotten tomb in the High Wilderness? It's a little strange, I admit. You certainly won't find this in Einhard. But there are legends that say the great king did not leave his people on death and instead sleeps in a barrow, waiting for their hour of need. He almost smiles. You query his people? I do not forget that we are British. He pauses for effect. But is our queen not of German parentage? Would not her ancestor look out for her? Europe's greatest monarch? As she embarks on her most significant endeavour? I mean, I can't doubt the, the logic there. What do you think of the feckless theologian? The paleographer is lost in thought. When he answers you, he looks rueful. The three of us were at college together in the same year. We were all interested in the theatre, but eventually pursued other things. I haven't seen him for years until the Traitor's Wood funding came up at the Senate. He sniffs. His intellect is second rate, but his charm is first class. We can't all be brilliant, he sighs despondently. What about the classicist? A remarkable scholar and a terrifying gonreal. At college, when she trod the boards, he shakes his head. Ancient history now which is her province, not mine. He makes a strong cup of tea for himself and then offers you the same. Bitterness has curdled her. He sips his drink, then grimaces. Like this milk. Return to the camp. Well, I think we've done everything we can here, so... Can we do an expedition into the deep wood? Somerset College has, until recently, funded expeditions into the forest. Those who return speak of voices on the wind, of murmurs in uninhabited groves. You must first decide how many crew you wish to take with you on your expedition. The more you take, the likelier your success, but at a risk of losing them all. Then choose your destination. So we can do a large expedition, which would require two supplies, and ten crew. We can do a small expedition. Uh, which will, will use one. No, two supplies, and it'll only use five crew. Either way, we can't do it because we don't have enough supplies. So, some other time. Badly concealed relief. Your crew are pleased to not have to stray far from the engine. The parting glade. The forest rises behind the station, but a few tents have been set up. What might be an owl calls from somewhere in the wood. In the far distance, a great stone barrow rises over the trees. The glade, an oasis of the wildflowers and sweet meadow field in the midst of the brooding trees, is where captains meet to do business and bring their ventures to the wood to conclusion. So, I can write a port report. There's no one here, but perhaps someone will take an interest in how the wood fares. Outside of the Somerset camp, the great forest of bronzewood trees has gone untouched by human hands. Voices sound in the deeps of the woods, forlorn and far away. The wood is vast and vastly lonely. We can explore the glade. Birds trill in nearby trees, and the sweet scent of flowers pervades the air. 
There is no one else here at present, but there are signs of recent passage. A discarded set of cups from some clandestine picnic. Loose paper hastily torn from a notebook. A few bullets in scorched grass. People come to the glade to conduct meetings as neutral ground and as a place to think, secluded from the watchful gaze of the high wilderness. Alright, well, I think that is everything we can do here. Is there a shop here? They, they are selling a jumble of undistinguished souls for 55. That seems really cheap. I'm actually going to pick those up. That's going to fill up my cargo, though, so maybe I shouldn't do that. They do sell supplies here, so I'm going to pick up some supplies. And I think... Do we do an expedition into the wood? Sure. Let's do a small expedition into the wood. We can't do a large one. It'll take only a few hardy souls. You risk fewer crew, but you increase the risk of failure, or the chance of failure. Can we use two fuel as well? We've got the fuel. A handful of your most loyal crew volunteer to join you. They hoist packs and eye each other with grim satisfaction. I'm sure this will be fine. If you leave while you have crew embarked on an expedition, it will not be available until you complete the expedition. Okay. So we can prepare for an expedition to the steward's font. The Somerset scholars believe that the font will provide clues to the identity of the king in the regent's grave. This expedition is moderately difficult. We can embark on an expedition for otherworldly artifacts. Whoever kept the wood has left ruins scattered about the forest. You need, you'll need to reach Traitor's Progress 5 to successfully complete an expedition. This is an expedition of moderate difficulty. Embark for Bronzewood. There are rumoured to be groves of ancient Bronzewood near the heart of the forest. A difficult expedition. Let's see if we can get to the steward's font. Moderate difficulty. How bad can it be? The scholars share, individually, what they know. Their transcriptions of the correspondence differ significantly, and they refuse to work together on a single translation. Still, it should be enough to get the general area of the font. You gather your crew and make for the edge of the whispering wood. The scholars emerge from their tents to wave you off. Thunder! shakes the trees. Storm's nearing, a signaller says, drawing up her hood. Should we be out in this, Captain? We can uh, press onwards for more progress with higher risk, or we can take shelter, send scouts to find a safe refuge, a safer but slower option, or we can leave. Let's go with the safer but slower option. No point taking unnecessary risks. While you wait, you shelter beneath a vast tree. It is the pale gold of a candle-lit manuscript page. The cover is inadequate. The flask of brandy does not last long enough. Then, torchlight nearby. Your scouts return. There is a hollow under an ancient tree where you can make camp. There's even a cache there. Someone has come through here before you. It begins to pour. The grey sky is angry. Your crew look desperate to make a camp, and progress will be slow over sodden ground. Perhaps this is an opportunity to recover some of your strength. It's like we just did, guys. Sure, let's rest and recover our strength. A navigator discovers a hollow way running through a vast copse of black wood. You can set a watch at both ends, and light a fire without being seen from elsewhere in the wood. Your crew stay up late, swapping stories of old rulers and their various ends. Your sleep is dreamless as death. Your teller has fallen. Hey, I'll take that. The ground gives way to a bog, grey and fetid as a newly slain corpse. It burps lazily. The marsh reads, susurrate, growing in volume as you approach. That is English amidst the polyphony. Names, yours, and those of the crew. So we can cross the Whispering Bog, 
21% chance of success, or we can search for another route. There must be a better, less noisome way. Let's try that. Oh dear. The wood extends for miles, but so too does the bog. It is hours before you find a passable clearing. A glade of emerald hue, nestled between a copse of silver trees that shiver and sigh like consumptives. Your crew follow your lead, hanging close by your torchlight. You keep up a count, checking the numbers of your crew as you go. Not everyone leaves the Silvered Woods. It's fine. We made it. Enter the steward's font. Below the thundering white water, a cave is visible, just under the lip of the rock. You scale down the wet rock face and into the cave. It is several moments before your eyes adjust to the light. The cavern is not natural. The walls are covered with bronzewood and studded with navarantine gemstones, driven in too deep to remove. Distant starlight from the cave mouth reflects off the stones, filling the cave with radiance. Towards the back of the cave, you find a silver seal in the size of a crown and a curved crescent blade. Correspondence is scored on the blade's battered metal. It is too large to move, but you record the sigils. Perhaps one of the scholars will be able to translate. You take the seal. Can I not take the, s the sword too? <laughs> Just saying. It's too large to move? No. Kind of, I think we could make it work, guys. I'll mount it to the front of the train. Well, we have gained our three crew back, so we only lost one, which could be worse. So the real question is, who do we talk to about our, our discovery? The theologian, the classicist, or the paleographer? I have a soft spot for Charlemagne, so let's talk to the, uh, the paleographer. You'll only be able to consult one scholar. They do not share their findings with rivals, and they guard their research jealous jealously. God damn it, which one did I go to last time? I don't remember. I don't remember ever doing this full stop, but I must have at some point. Um, I guess there's an argument to say that I probably never would have picked a theologian. Knowing, knowing me, I probably picked the classicist because that one resonates with me the most. Sumerian queen of heaven. Maybe I picked a theologian. Let's go with Charlemagne. Yeah, why not? Let's side with this guy. Please translate the scythe. He's very keen to know what, if anything, you found in the wood. The dismal paleographer grabs your notes eagerly. He is swift to an initial translation. This is a gift for service. Carologian kings gave gifts, spoils, riches, offices, for loyalty. He pauses. Eh? What's this? The paleographer labours over your notes for several hours. At last, he rises from his desk. I think this one was given as an office. Tamer of the King's... Boa? But that's no position that I know of. It gave authority over the giggling place, located somewhere deep. You have a map? It would be easier. He scrolls markings onto your map. Hey, we gained 250 sovereigns for that? But we have to take another expedition to the giggling place. Hmm. I don't think I'll be doing that in this episode, that's for sure. But I'm guessing that... Is that going to require... Yeah, it's going to be the same. Hmm. So the real question is, in the next episode, do I want to try and carry on? I mean, I don't think I've got enough fuel, have I? I guess I could buy more fuel. They sell fuel here, right? No. Okay, maybe I'd have to go and get more fuel, and then we could do another expedition into the wood, whilst maybe also trying to find the bees that are required to fix the magician's box. I haven't forgotten. But I think this is a perfect place for me to end this episode. So I'm going to thank you very much for watching. Please like, subscribe, let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated. Thank you again to the members of the channel. It, the support means the world to me. It really does help making these videos. But either way, thank you very much for watching. And as always, I'll see you next time.